All righty. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ground Rounds. I'm very happy to introduce our Ground Rounds speaker today, Dr. Elizabeth Craig, with her talk on the chronicity of disasters and the university role. Dr. Craig is currently an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Miami, and is a co-director of the University of Miami Global Institute for Community Health and Development. She's a graduate of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and completed her internal medicine residency at the New York Presbyterian Cornell and holds a certificate in community preparedness and disaster management from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she was previously faculty. It was at the University of Miami where she started her career in global health working in Haiti in 2006, focusing on disaster management. As a fourth year medical student, Dr. Craig's research and field work in Port of Port of Prince laid the groundwork for UN and Jackson Memorial Hospital deployment of 5,000 volunteers serving over four months, operating a 240 bed field hospital, treating approximately 20,000 patients and completing approximately 3,000 surgeries. Since then, Dr. Craig has continued to work in Haiti to turn the field hospital into a trauma center with residency training programs. She has led hospital responses to Hurricane Sandy in New York and Hurricane Matthew in North Carolina, and most recently led the develop deployment of UM physicians, reconstruction projects, and community health development following Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. She runs the Global Health Pathway for the Medicine and Med Beats Residency Program, a university-wide disaster simulation course, and is the co-director for the scholarly concentration in the next-gen MD curriculum. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Craig. Who I think has unsuccess, okay, I'm on. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, perfect. Hello, blank squares of the Department of Medicine. Um, it's great to be here today. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the true bio actually for the medical students who might be listening is that as, as George was saying, you know, I really got a career in disaster management and global health started as a medical student, which is still work that I do to this day. But I'll tell you what really happened before I showed up at University of Miami and why. One day through a weird set of circumstances, I actually made it, I was in a bar with Paul Farmer. So Paul Farmer was meeting a very impressive friend of mine and I tagged along and we were sitting having conversation with a couple other people, but the focus was on uh, uh, my friend. And Paul Farmer turned to me and said, where are you thinking about matriculating? Because we had you know, a couple offers on the table. We were trying to decide where to go. And I said, I'm, I, I'm, I think I'm going to go to the University of Miami. And a whole bunch of heads turned around sitting at this table. And Paul Farmer turned to me and said, you have to go to the University of Miami. There is no other place that executes community stewardship and global health and sits in such a unique place and walks the talk like University of Miami. And I, and then it turned out that I was sitting also at the table with um, the daughters of Jay Weiss, who um, had funded the Jay Weiss pathway in social medicine that still exists for the medical students today. And Jay Weiss himself, uh, a major uh, philanthropic power at, at Jackson and UM. And I could not believe my luck. And I actually ended up matriculating from the bar uh, to the University of Miami. And here I am. And Paul Farmer was right, as he often is. And so, um, and so now I have the pleasure of, of having learned here and now uh, working here. Um, so with that in mind, the topic today is on my focus in disaster management. So we're going to learn about how long-term agendas following a disaster using the examples that um, have been led by UM and also looking at how our international focus is, is either has either changed or will change um, in the setting of COVID-19. And then also just a little bit about how thinking like disaster management experts applying it to your practice. So unfortunately, um, you know, many times when I'm sitting in grand rounds, I think like, ah, this is totally over my head and completely out of my field. But, uh, but now everybody on this call is a disaster management expert. 
And so uh, unfortunately, we've had uh, quite the orientation into disaster management if you hadn't uh, if you hadn't been involved in it before. I have no disclosures except for this one. And, um, and, and in thinking about UM's global health agenda, what Paul Farmer was telling me at that bar is that UM is, is truly like uniquely situated in that our international partnerships mirror our local environment. Most of the time our involvement is throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's just like what we see here in, in Miami. The, the partnership development that has occurred you know, years and years before I got here are uniquely beneficial for both our institution and for our institutions abroad. And, and I think there is a cognizance that familiarity and proximity reduces but doesn't eliminate the risk of propagating the colonialism and on which global health tends to be based and, and, and imbalances that creep into these partnership programs. Um, so I think we're very cognizant and aware of that and do our best and do our best to, to mitigate it and develop programs, uh, keeping, keeping those things in mind. You know, our, our situation is a, is a little different than where other global health institutions operate. It's not the same as, you know, a, a, a program in Boston working with a program in Rwanda. You know, th those, two dif those two places are, are disconnected and very foreign to each other. Um, and, and although those programs are, and that one in particular, extraordinarily successful, it's just a different vibe, essentially, than these are our neighbors, our friends, our family that we're working with um, in, in very close proximity, even though they're international, international agendas. So I realize there are some unintentional UM comedy in the titles to these slides, but you know, UM itself also has to think about how disaster prone we are in terms of physical disasters um, that, uh, that um, that we're susceptible to the same to the same types of disasters that we are looking at in our partner institutions abroad. So in Haiti and the Bahamas, obviously hurricanes are um, are amongst the top threats. We have the same threats here, and we have systems in place internally to to deal with all of all of these disasters and emergency management. And applying them to other places like ours and close by isn't too far of a leap. So, um, so using a university in a sense of disaster response where you're not intrinsically part of the disaster I'm talking about here, um, you know, you can pull from a variety of fields of expertise, right? So primarily we think about the medical response and, and the, the initial responses to a disaster driven by the medical center. But longer term intervention could come from any domain across the university, you know, and we have so many different domains that deal with a sort of disaster, climate change, uh, rebuilding, public health, um, that a university is like a mini, UN or a mini government filled with experts that may not be uh, able to execute all of these things, but they can at least play a consulting role. And obviously in a complex disaster, the definition of a complex disaster is that it, that it drives a disaster from multiple domains, social, socioeconomic, um, and medical, among others, right? Another positive is that at a university, we already have a donor pool from which to solicit. Um, which generally doesn't divert donations from other causes at universities if you're sort of pulling into this extra pulling into this extra pool. And then optimally, a university is positioned to further the field of disaster response through self-reflection and research. And research in this area is really um, underdone. And, um, and having that introspection, plus publishing about it serves a, a lot of value in disaster response as we try to make it more, uh, you know, more standardized and have training in it. And really, uh, as opposed to this kind of like, well, it's a disaster and your hair is on fire, so just kind of do the best you can. Disaster management is a professionalized field like any other. And in medicine, this is the case. So this is a very changing uh, environment in terms of research and, and underdone for, uh, for the most part. And a university can be uh, super important here. You know, the downside to uh, an academic medical center's role in disaster response is, 
<laughs> is that they're usually not nimble enough, right? So the last time you tried to order like a printer cartridge, did it take 450 emails? Probably, right? But um, to be a first responder, there are other organizations that do that better depending on the context. Um, and and an and, and, and inability to have the infrastructure in place is a major detriment to being able to respond to uh, emergencies. Um, in this case, like they're, they're, they tend to be better suited for medium and long range partnerships. So not running into um, the disaster zone, but sort of a partnership that goes beyond, uh, goes beyond the initial stages. Either way, you have to have an institutional buy-in and an infrastructure to back it up, mirroring like our own systems for disaster. And I, this goes probably without saying, but I cannot give a lecture on disaster management without mentioning what an incredible group of people our emergency management team actually is. So prior to COVID, these were sort of probably invisible, uh, you know, motions behind the scenes that you didn't have too much, I hope, interaction with. Um, and now COVID has brought all of these, this personnel, this and and all of this kind of framework into everyone's front view. And I have to say that of all the universities that I've been involved with um, or worked with and have had to work within the emergency management system, there is nothing like the professionals that make up um, the University of Miami's emergency management team. So um, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I think they could even be like, like an academic, you know, they could, you know, they should have med students running through there and all kinds of stuff. And I'm sure they're not all that psyched to hear that suggestion, but, uh, but maybe there are. And uh, because you can learn, you can learn a ton from how these guys operate and they're excellent and a, a great team. So when I was a medical student, um, this happened. And the, in disaster management, the, the two questions they always ask you is, where were you when so-and-so happened? And then the other one is like, what's the worst thing you've ever had to do, right? So where and I, I was here, I was a residency interview um, in New York. And I remember um, seeing it like flash on the CNN or something on TV that there was an earthquake in Haiti. And I had spent the past four years basically you know, traveling back and forth to Port-au-Prince, assessing what would happen if there was a mass casualty, mass casualty incident in Port-au-Prince, what were the facilities that could help people, where would anyone go, mapping out the hospitals, mapping out the pre-hospitals, um, planning, and, um, and trying to figure out what would happen with this. And I, I, I you know, I had a 90 page like working document essentially that went through all the potential hazard analysis that you could put together for Port-au-Prince from like hurricanes to civil unrest to Godzilla and, and nowhere on my radar screen was an earthquake. No expert had ever mentioned it to me. No, um, it had never come up in any kind of hospital planning I had seen or Ministry of Health planning. It was, I, it was just mind boggling. And when I saw the, when I saw the headline, I figured it was like, you know, when there's an earthquake in Pennsylvania or whatever, then, you know, it's just this little rumble and everyone thinks it's a strange anomaly. But it wasn't. It was this, obviously. And I'm sure um, many, many people on this call remember this also happening and remember what happened afterwards, the many days of chaos and the magnitude of this disaster was it, it's still hard to fathom. And it was a 7.0 earthquake. Um, their deaths are estimated about 20,000, um, but they can't even get a number still on the death count at this point because the, the scope of the disaster was so astronomical. So, you know, think about the first, you know, eight months of COVID, all of the destruction in the U.S. This was 30 seconds and functionally uh, that many deaths in one city. So in, in context, you know, the per people killed per million inhabitants just, just through the roof in terms of the scope of this disaster and um, just truly how scary it was and the sub, like long-term consequences that come with it. In addition to the personal toll 
250,000 residences, 30,000 commercial buildings, the Presidential Palace, the National Cathedral, National Assembly Building, both cellular service networks, the, the headquarters of the UN who, t who run international disaster response, not to mention provided in Port-au-Prince at that time, a good amount of the security and logistics of day-to-day -day life in Port-au-Prince, the death of the mission, mission chief and 101 staff at the UN and uh, the emergency operations center for as little as it did also destroyed. So infrastructure damage completely catastrophic and you know the end of days kind of thing. Um, there was no airport, there was really no hospital functional um, and there was no port. There was the roads were were blocked with de debris and and the vulnerabilities in your when you do one of these kind of analyses that I had been doing, you look at the vulnerabilities that leading up to the disaster and those things, you know, in categories, physical vulnerability, social, economic and environmental uh, vulnerability and and Port-au-Prince has like all um, ticks all the boxes, you know, densely populated urban area. Um, Island nations, which is my sort of academic focus, you know, you are really isolated. And in Haiti, you have that sort of doubly so. They're sort of the closest islands, Cuba and the Dominican Republic, in which it shares an island, very isolated from those particular places. Um, shoddy construction, open flame cooking, uh, low literacy rates, very little security uh, logistics, a lot of insecure, like, you know, gang violence and, 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 and insecurity in that department. Um, the vast majority of people live in extreme poverty and there was a long history of government corruption. And most of the infrastructure, much, much, much at that time uh, of the infrastructure was led by other NGOs, um, non-governmental organizations that were international organizations that, um, that do a variety of things, literacy, healthcare, um, you know, social empowerment programs, you name it. There were thousands and thousands of NGOs at the time. And I always pick on these poor guys. I got to find a new NGO to pick on. Clouds without borders, you know. So um, they're, they're, they were, they are, were and are still everywhere. Um, the economic vulnerabilities, zero res resources devoted to safety, no building codes, no regulatory bodies, um, no emergency preparedness, poor communications, and zero financial cush cushion for an expensive setback. So a disaster is, they're expensive, you know, you and you have to funnel some money. You're not going to do it very efficiently, and um, and that's kind of the nature of the beast. So, um, so being prepared for that is important, but when you are unprepared and you cannot get what you need, um, your disaster response is obviously going to suffer. The normal environmental vulnerabilities, earth, uh, hurricanes, deforestation, soil toxicity, pollution, poor sanitation, um, you name it. And a lot of these, although not part of the initial insult, went on to become uh, sort of subsequent insults that added insult to injury. And, and if you think about the poor sanitation, the cholera outbreak that broke, that broke out from peacekeepers that had come to Haiti subsequent to the earthquake um, and, and causing like a secondary disaster. So, and structural violence shouldn't go unmentioned. So uh, social inequalities kind of lie at the heart of this concept. Structural violence directly illustrates a power system wherein social structures or institutions cause harm to people in a way that results in maldevelopment or deprivation. And so it's caused by and can be corrected by human decisions. And the structural violence in Haiti, um, you know, is mul from multiple domains, but was really is really sort of spurred on by a lot of political instability and, and corruption. Um, so my project when I was a medical student was driving around Port-au-Prince, taking pictures of dangerous stuff, and um, and taking some some capacity, you know, assessment of, of what the, of what the, um, of what the hospital system and pre-hospital system looked like. This is the WHO trauma and maturity index. When I was a third, third year medical student, second year medical student, I thought I was going to become a trauma surgeon. And now I'm a general internist. So go figure, made the right choice there. And, um, and so this is where sort of Haiti and Port-au-Prince generally lies on this scale, obviously pretty low in terms of education and training, pre-hospital trauma care, and the facility-based care even lower. So capacity for actually treating trauma-based injury like next to nothing, you know. Um, this was the outlay of, of trauma 
capability in Port-au-Prince in 2009. And you can see that four of these hospitals with trauma capability are MSF, Doctors Without Borders. So that's an NGO running those. And then HUEH is the um, state hospital uh, uh, run by the government. This was the burn unit, the state-of-the-art burn unit in uh, MSF Trinité before the earthquake. And um, we went to go visit to see what the capacity was there. Burn injuries are um, a, a big percentage of uh, injuries in Haiti with or without earthquakes. And, um, and because of the open flame oil-based cooking, and so, but this was the capacity. I mean, your living room probably has more burn capability than this, but, um, but after the earthquake, that hospital was destroyed with the rest of them. These are the staff from um, MSF operating in the container that was uh, set up right outside of their uh, former hospital. And the scope of the response was huge. I mean, I'm sure you, a lot of you remember 2,000 NGOs, 400 of which were healthcare providing. This is in functionally kind of in one city, right? 26 countries provided military assets and the US by far and away provided the largest response. So 22,000 troops, 17 ships, 48 helicopters, heavy equipment, field hospital, hospital ships, cargo ships. They took control of the Port-au-Prince airport and uh, where, where our hospital was stationed and um, you would just see sort of like unimaginable things being unloaded out of out of planes and stuff like that. You never really realize like the capability. You know, bulldozer, you needed a bulldozer, you can ask them for it. You needed Tostitos, they had those. You know, I mean, it was just it was this sort of unimaginable amount of um, stuff. And it cost a couple bucks, 1.1 billion government agencies uh, was the military response. Charities also raised 1.4 billion and many academic institutions actually responded to this. So uh, certainly out of the wheelhouse of, um, of, what they, of what they normally do in an emergency, but the scope of this emergency was just like, it, it's so hard to even really describe it, but there were a lot of academic institutions on the ground and not, any of them look like this, right? So this was the University of Miami's field tent hospital that was on the grounds of the airport. And this was like a colossus, you know? I mean, so this was a 240 bed field hospital. The tent, let's see, can you see my mouse? I'm not sure, but the tent over here on the right was where uh, volunteers stayed. This is all supply and all the rest of this stuff um, came in from Miami personnel. I don't think they, they might've like emptied out Jackson. I don't know, <laughs> but there were a lot of people involved, a ton of volunteers, doctors, nurses. Um, and this was like a mission driven, um, uh, you know, work of the university of Miami at the time. This was the warehouse in Miami that would like get filled, planes would get filled up every day or twice a day and get sent out and get sent out there. So, um, and, 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 and it, was a, it was a pretty impressive, it was a pretty impressive operation. No, no one's academic institution did anything of this magnitude. That's, I can say that for sure. And I'll tell you that, um, that uh, when I was at that residency interview, it took about an hour for me to get a call saying like, can you come home? And I did, and then I was on a plane a couple of days later to work to sort of work the logistics of this un unfolding operation. So for you, for for medical students that are doing projects that think you know like I was, I thought of like oh, this is like a sort of rinky dink, you know, project, and I'll move on after this and go to residency and then do another thing or whatever. I got yanked out of school, and this is the org chart that was published. Uh, by UM in the an Annals of Internal Medicine. And I just want to point out to the medical students that this <laughs> of that stuff was me, right? So, you know, I for, for educators, you know, I'm always kind of like, I'll have moments where I'm sitting around with, you know, a med student in the clinic thinking like, should I let them do this pap smear or not? And then I think, you know, back to whatever conversation where some leadership was having like, well, who should we have to run this uh, giant field hospital that we put down there? Oh, let's uh, get the president of Kane Chair to do it. So I, I think, um, you know, the opportunities at University of Miami, <laughs> Paul Farmer was right. And, uh, and I think we even kind of, I even kind of one-upped him. But 
it, in in the in the aftermath of the um, in the aftermath of 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 the earthquake, um, there was a lot of attention paid because so many people responded um, to the earthquake and responded in many bad ways that uh, there was a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking about how the response went. And obviously academic institutions were, um, were the most introspective. So, um, so, and I think universally across the literature, uh, academic medical centers, you know, to make an, have an effective response everywhere, they need a local partnership. In most cases, in most scenarios, an NGO and the buy-in of the local government. So local, it brings you local infrastructure and personnel, credibility that goes both ways. If you're attached to a credible institution on the ground and you are a credible institution, those things can help each other. Um, and then you have to, if you're partnered with an institution that's gonna be there after you're potentially gone, you're always looking towards sustainability planning. And in emergency management, looking at the long game from the onset of the disaster is one of the most important things that you can do and learn as an emergency manager. So, um, and that is very hard to do in the throes of 200,000 people dying at once and you bringing all of your infrastructure from Miami or you're mired in a hurricane or you're completely surrounded by a disaster and responding to a disaster, which is sort of all what we've been going through um, with COVID. Trying to understand the long game here is like, do, do we need to do that and how do we do it? And, and you know, how do you, how, do you, how do you stay nimble enough to change as the game changes? Um, So in Haiti in particular, the University of Miami has had a long-standing partnership with Project MediShare. And, um, and same thing with the other major responding, um, major responding academic medical centers, Harvard University and Partners in Health, um, and Cornell University and Jeskio, which is primarily, formal, primarily uh, a um, infectious disease focused organization um, who made some of the first and most impressive strides in tuberculosis and uh, AIDS in a developing country anywhere. So looking at the pre and post earthquake status, you know, this is a picture that I took in one of those trips in September 2009 of an ambulance parked in a parking spot, four flat tires, doesn't go anywhere. And in March 2010, I found the same ambulance, same parking spot, same flat tires, right? And, and but at the same time, what had happened between January and March is like, just an explosion of capacity, right? There are a million field hospitals out there that can now do all kinds of stuff that was never available in Port-au-Prince ever before. So surgical capacity, you know, ICU capacity, and everyone is full. Everyone's full all the time, right? So there, and this is months out. So it's not acute injury. This is just filling the void of what wasn't there that needed to be there in the first place. And Project MediShare also was a primary care organization out in a rural area. That was the primary focus, mobile health clinics, um, home visits, uh, education campaigns, water hand, hand, <clears throat> hygiene and sanitation. And, um, and, and many, I can't, I'm, I'm, I struggle with this, but that, that I think a crop of medical students might go all the way through medical school at this point and not get a chance to actually go um, visit Haiti and go out to work with MediShare out in the rural plateau area. It's obviously a, a career defining experience for me, but the political instability in Haiti plus COVID have, has led to um, it just not being like a safe thing to do. But nonetheless, this was there was this was the mission there. And now the mission is this, right? So weeks out, we have an ICU, we have people with multifocal pneumonias who are coming in that are they is like indirectly related to the earthquake, but now there's this capacity and how do you back out from this capacity, right? So if you have long-term strategic planning in mind when the emergency starts, you have no plans to move out you have no plans to reduce this capacity in the end, right? Your goal is to figure out how to make this capacity like standard, right? So building a field hospital and then taking it away is, is not what you really want to be doing. So I think when people focus on the emergency response, they kind of see this designated time frame, And a lot of NGOs and response organizations like have that mandate, but then they have to hand all that stuff off to local partners. And in fact, Doctors Without Borders had been trying initially to get, to get 
like to offload the trauma center because they saw their mission as complete. They're a short-term organization. They're not in it to like buoy up the healthcare system in, in a, in a longevity kind of way, but they really had to change their mission. They got stuck there for years. And then after the earthquake, they're still, they're still stuck there. And I say stuck, but like that is their, that's kind of their mission, but actually extricating yourself from these kind of things is impossible. And it's not even, it's not really the right thing to do. So, you know, the world goes on. Some people have to have triplets in the middle of an emergency. And, and sort of, we were the hospital that was, that was doing this kind of thing. So what do we do about getting out of there? Everyone's got to go back to work at UM and, um, we don't have money forever, right? So, but because we have those long-term partnerships with an NGO on the ground and some, you know, street cred in in um, Haiti, based on because of where we work here in Miami and um, our earlier partnerships, uh, you know, we were we had to move forward. So there was a long-term one-year goal. Um, the, the field hospital moved from those, that tent facility into a bricks and mortar hospital. So this was like basically an outpatient surgery center. Um, and all of a sudden their new mandate is that they're a trauma center, right? So the one-year goal was to get all that equipment and stuff moved over here. And so it was, and, um, and then and then how to build capacity, right? So then when all of your um, ICU nurses leave, right? How do, you, how do you replace those people if ICU capacity is all totally novel, right? And, and one way to do that, uh, that crosses all spectrum is, is using GME as a capacity builder, right? So, um, so this, has, this, is actually, um, this is actually an example from Partners in Health who did uh, the same kind of work and continue to do the same kind of work and do it extraordinarily well. This is in 2012, 2013, there were 130, my thing's blocking it, 39 residency positions in Haiti across all specialties, right? So not like a totally robust amount of training and um, uh, training positions. And uh, the idea here was to increase those residency positions um, and develop like an ACGME accredited program from which Haitian uh, medical graduates could, could go through residency, partner those with a, a US-based institution. And at, at a hospital, Bernard Mez, the what our field hospital that is now the hospital hospital, the same model was, you know, one of our faculty, Tony, Tony Esseline, had developed a pediatric developed a pediatric residency program um, that uh, that's that has been cranking out uh, pediatric residency graduates trained particularly in critical care um, uh, for many years now and um, the results and and that's extraordinarily impressive and has like sort of single-handedly developed the capacity of that hospital from both the trainee, the residents, the attendings perspective, um, partnership programs with UM for us to partner with them to train uh, and to train us. And, um, and also, you know, from every, also for every ancillary staff uh, position to sort of the, the level of training has gone up. At Partners in Health, Zomni La Sante, that's the, um, the other residency program. Six years after starting, they had developed five GME programs. There were 84 residents active in the programs as of now and 67 graduates. And only one of those 67 graduates had left Haiti. So all of them had stayed after all of this um, training to, to remain in Haiti, which is, which is the goal you know, for capacity building. Dr. De Martina put in some uh, cool graphics here, I see, or <laughs> animations that I am not capable of using. But at the, on the same token, this is like our forte, right? So graduate, international graduate medical education um, has been something that we at the University of Miami and Dr. De Martina and others have been doing for many, many years. And the reach of these programs are very, are very, it's very wide. I mean, it skews somewhat towards Caribbean and, the Latin, and Latin America. Un understandably, that's our focus, but 10,000 observers in that time. And this year, because COVID derailed that program, um, like thinking on, 
you know, turning that program on a dime because understanding the value of it, both for us and for international trainees, um, it's not something that can actually take a year off, right? So um, Dr. De Martina was kind enough to share these slides of how, you know, the observership move forward without with the restrictions of COVID and, and how global health has been completely ironically stymied by um, a global emergency affecting uh, affecting everyone simultaneously. So you can imagine what kind of like permissions and all kinds of stuff it takes to get a, a cow with a camera attached to your team and rounds in the ICU, but they did it and they did it, they did it very well. And um, some extraordinary, some extraordinary uh, compensatory mechanisms here. And on top of that, they were able to reach instead of their usual pool in the Caribbean and Latin America, a, a worldwide global um, attract, attraction for this for this particular program. Like what time the guy in Australia is rounding, who knows, but you know, more power to him. There's obviously some motivation to, to see what goes on at, at UMH from around the globe. So that's amazing to see. So 11 years later now, you know, we're still at it. That hospital still exists. You can still go down there and volunteer at a trauma center 11 years later. And I left this institution for eight years and probably was on a phone call or two a week with the University of Miami to keep this thing, to keep this thing rolling. So you, you kind of don't see that once the disaster response kind of fades away from the initial, uh, the initial um, uh, point of view and the big like emergency emergency and all this stuff has to keep going and uh you guys know that better than better than anyone so um now there is a in in because there was nothing to do but construct buildings there um uh, there's a you know a whole hospital being built this that we got too big for the original trauma center and so there's a new trauma center being built and uh, we'll all get there we'll all get there eventually this is it and it's sitting there right there in City de Soleil. Many interruptions in construction, but it's moving forward. Same thing in the Bahamas. So, um, so Hurricane Dorian, it's hard to even remember at this point, but um, blew through in, October, in September 2019, uh, hit March Harbor, you can see here as a category five hurricane, and then uh, made its way across Grand Bahama and, um, and sat on top of uh, the Grand, Grand Bahama for a long time. This is a time-lapse video of the hurricane, which was an absolute monster. And I'm sure it wasn't that long ago, although it feels like a million years ago at this point, everybody remembers what they were doing when this one walled through, because I was sitting in my you know, living room in Miami Beach saying goodbye to all of my belongings as this thing kind of made its way through, made its way through the Bahamas. So this thing, a monster, Her, category five hurricane. So it blows through Marsh Harbor, as you can see right there, and then travels over like almost the whole of, or half of the Western half of Grand Bahama and sits there and sits there for 48 hours. You can watch the time lapse here, but it's moving along. And then you would wake up day after day in Miami and the hurricane hadn't gone anywhere. Right. And these guys are sitting under a category five storm for 48 hours. I mean, astronomical amount of damage. Right. So it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying to even watch this and, and just imagine it. Um, and UM's response again, was like a full throttle response. Never underestimate the power of the football team here, right? So this is the, the football team after after the after the hurricane in one of their games at Hard Rock, and then the Bahamian flag on the back of the helmet. So a full throttle sort of effort towards um, responding. So we went out there a couple days afterwards and took a look around. This is us on Grand Bahama. That's Vince Torres from Emergency Management. And uh, the guy in the orange vest is uh, the CEO of Direct Relief, which is our NGO partner institution in the Bahamas and other places. And he uh, basically, that organization supplies um, stuff, medical equipment, uh, PPE, uh, medicines into disaster zones. So we're there kind of having a conversation with the head of the hospital administrator there, a government employee about what the needs are and, and what's, uh, what's happening there. So, so when, when making that assessment and bringing it back to a university, you can see how a university actually mirrors what happens in 
a humanitarian emergency. This is how a international humanitarian emergency runs. All of the UN institutions run their domain. And you know, you could imagine every school sort of fitting into this, this capability. So, so Vince and I came back and said, there's nothing, there's nothing to do right now. You know, there are a zillion people on the ground that do this for a living. Their physicians are deployed. There's not that many injuries. You know, the whole place is blown up and there's going to need be so much infrastructure that needs to be replaced and repaired and social programs that are going to have to be put in. And mostly you're going to discover gaps in what should have been there that isn't. And, and then that's a longer term thing, but there aren't, there isn't much need. So from September to December, you know, as, as a zillion um, NGOs and deployment capacity goes down to zero in December, the Bahamian government said like, we need doctors and there's, there's no one else, right? So our deployment was delayed, but we had partnered with the government and said like, you know, when, when, when it gets restructured, you let us know and you let us know what the needs are and we're gonna tell you what we have to offer and keep offering it up. And then this is what they called and asked for first. So many Department of Medicine people on here, thank you so much. Um, and, and really people were applying to like a primary care emergency. So the people to respond to this was the Department of Medicine and, and respond they did. So I'm eternally grateful. It was staffed continuously that hospital from uh, the 1st of December to the 8th of March when COVID interrupted the whole operation. But I mean, on Christmas day, there were UM doctors there covering that ER. So um, special thanks to everybody who did that. So in, so after COVID hit, right, the deployment ended and everyone made the exact same recommendation that came back that healthcare is housing. All the, what they need is housing. The physicians need housing. The staff needs housing. It's demoralizing. It's inhumane. They have nowhere to live. It's not safe. After COVID, it was an infection risk. Everybody was sleeping on the floor to the hospital for six months and to this day still, still are. So, um, so even though housing isn't what I do as a healthcare provider, everybody here knows that it's like a major issue within your health, right? So um, housing they shall get. And this was this was this is the rendering of what's going up, and you know, Dee Dee Farmer um, basically orchestrated this with the School of Architecture, and um, and it's going up. And I don't think you've really lived as a disaster management until you try to put a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar charge for an international building through Workday, but nonetheless, it's all happening. So the public-private partnership that we envision here involves medical education, ongoing medical education. It's a three-year plan, not like a six-month plan, right? So the infrastructure repairs are one thing, crisis staffing is another, but medical education really here is, is what we're looking for. Community health work care program um, and a, a global education program to both build capacity in the Abacos and be a partner clinical site for UM. Um, and, and, and I think like, you know, thinking about how these things go, go long term, you really are looking for moving a disaster into a longer term opportunity. And that's where a, a university really fits in and honestly is our absolute forte. So, um, so, and I think there's plenty of interest, plenty of interest for it. So those are two, two ways in which there are two examples in which um, and, uh, disasters have been leveraged for longer term purposes. But some of the longer term purposes, I think, come out of the come out of the view and then and then you kind of don't realize that that's a sort of ongoing disaster and then making those opportunities happen as a result of the disaster. So all of us are emergency managers now and um, and and there's always some fascination about what tra attracts people to the field or repulses people from the field if you've now had the experience that you never want to again. Um, but it's interesting to think about in the context of being a, an internist because I think we don't typically think of ourselves as going running off into disasters and being disaster types, but actually I think we're very well suited to do it. So adaptability, this is one of the tropes of emergency management, and but I think it holds pretty true. Adaptability is about the power difference between adapting to cope and adapting to win. So these long-term strategies are, are where it's at. So this is, a, this is an example of, how the, this is how FEMA works, a leadership structure, the National Incident Management System. And this is like the incident command system. So this is how, this is a flexible 
leadership structure for a disaster. So maybe you're like minding your own business as mm, Dr. Shukla is and as an infection control person and COVID hits, right? So this leadership structure is meant to be totally flexible. An incident commander is not a job that someone has at FEMA that like where you plug that incident commander into the incident and then they become the incident commander, right? It's, it's they, you pick someone that's mired in the disaster that is a stakeholder and has those leadership capabilities and is the sort of person that's gonna be uh, the right person for the specific issue. It's meant to foster interagency like connections so that you have a framework with some stability and hierarchy, but not one that's so static that you know you don't have the flexibility because in a disaster, Everything is changing all of the time. And generally speaking, they're sort of mission driven, not compliance driven. And this like idea that you're always future planning and taking having an offensive stance is, better, is, is your best defense. And one of the most important things that we sort of train disaster managers to do to think critically is to frame your problems in a set of domains. So simple, that's sort of like a checklist that you can use. Complicated, where you're implementing a best practice complex where you're evaluating multiple options and there's a right answer and you're implementing a good practice and then chaotic, which your goal there is really to establish enough order to just bump it down to a complex situation so that you can make some headway on it. And, um, and, and this is one way to think about it. You know, a lot of this stuff actually comes out of business literature. And this is the Kunevin framework, which I had to write down because my Welsh is extremely terrible. And, uh, and, and, and you can see that like these domains actually border each other in sort of surprising ways. So simple can turn into chaotic if you have, if you, have um, you know, a set of structures that really is algorithmic thinking and then you can't think outside of the box if it goes wrong, right? It doesn't just bump up the next level, it goes like totally out of control. So, um, so this sort of everything revolving around disorder and trying to get it down to the next complicated, next complicated level to turn it easy. So in chaos, which we have been all experiencing, to, to a certain extent, top-down leadership is just imperative to move chaos to com like to complexity so you can get some traction to work on it. Um, but, but in terms of leadership, like intellect and intuition and charisma are generally not enough. And oftentimes people, leaders who find success within chaos are sort of exalted in that context and then are really unable to adapt their style as a crisis evolves. And it's sort of fascinating to watch like DeSantis as an example here, um, who has gone from like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, de decisive leadership, derided for making the wrong choices, exalted for actually making some good choices when they thought they were bad. And then is, is he going to make subsequent good choices or is he going to make subsequent bad choices because his choices before paid off for it. You know, so you kind of don't know, but this guy, poor guy is kind of getting um, raked over the coals. Or is he the next president? You have no idea. So, but in chaotic situations, there's often impelled some of the best innovations. So it's important not to like lose the opportunity that is chaos, but you're always trying to get out of it. And this is just for your reference later, if you want to take a look at it. And this idea of cognitive stamina, the ability to frame an issue and view it from different perspectives, instead of under the tendency to, of stress to immediately try and solve the issue, that's what, that's what medicine people are pretty good at, right? And the idea of cognitive stamina, I mean, just, just, that, just that phrase, whatever it means, kind of, it's, you know, like that's what you've been trained to do, in my opinion. So the, the, it aims for an iterative approach, right? So... Um, this is an example of, of decision, decisions an emergency manager would have to make. This is how hurricane evacuations work. There's basically a computer program that takes into all the account speed of the hurricane, when it's going to hit, your egress is like how many cars you can fit on I-95 going north or south, how many people live in that area, how many of them are tourists, how many shelters there are. Very complicated like algorithm to think about when you evacuate someone. So you put all that stuff in, the computer sort of spits out 
a number for you. There's Hanover County in North Carolina, and it's 41.3 times uh, th hours to evacuate that area. That's a long. That's a long time. So you're doing it. You have to do it four days in advance, which is, which is pretty far. You have to be able to evaluate this total issue, the hazard analysis, your behavioral analysis. You know how people be react in this situation. Your transportation options. Um, and, and then plug in all these different places and make it happen. And you are starting when you do this, like a six hour between advisories PDSA cycle, right? You're changing your, you're tweaking, you're adjusting and you're, and you're going with it and you have to make an executive decision. So these things are pretty stressful and they go wrong badly. So Hurricane Rita, 111 deaths in the hurricane, three were related to the direct impact from the storm but 90 were related to the evacuation process. And 50% of those 90 people were just people that died in their vehicle while driving away. They got stuck in traffic. They had a medical emergency. There was nowhere to go. They overheated without their air conditioning on. I mean, catastrophic effects here. And what happened here, one of the reasons was that Hurricane Katrina had happened a couple of weeks before and people were scared because of that. So, so, and how do emergency management professionals actually do at this? They actually do badly. So compared to other and critical thinking analysis, compared to other managers across all spectrums, they actually do worse. <laughs> so why is that? Like, you know, there's some, there's some, you know, if you're sort of hiring all kinds of adrenaline junkies to be in this, you know, you're, you, you might be picking from the wrong pool, but it's not totally understood. So, you know, general internists aren't, aren't really adrenaline junkies, right? And I pulled this one because it was the funniest thing that happened on the internet. But basically, this is a story about a cardiologist and a nephrologist that got into fisticuffs on the wards because one of them continued a medication that shall remain nameless, right? This isn't us, right? This is hilarious because like, this happened, right? So, you know, this is not, and, 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 and the one thing that I want to, I want to like send home here is that that second question that they always ask emergency management people, like, what's the worst thing that you've ever been involved in? Now, universally, the answer is COVID. You know, it is COVID. So everybody here has now been a doctor in like the worst emergency response, no matter what you had to do. And, and 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 you and you survived it. You know, and the, the good news is that you'll come out the other side with some fondness for it. The thing that you did that was amazing. You know, I didn't have anything to do with like higher level COVID preparation or response or anything like that. All I had to do was get to my normal job and execute my normal functions. And I still think it was the hardest thing that I ever had to do all year. So if you're feeling down about yourself, then then don't. I mean, this is the new, this is the new worst thing by a lot. But, you know, internists I, and, and everyone in the department, I think, well suited to, to take this on. And we have to get to kind of the next step here from moving from chaos to just complexity. We're kind of there after a year. We got to embrace moving out of the emergency phase and look at your practices and frame your issues. And, and now's the time where we really need that kind of innovation. And thinking about behavioral analysis, like how disaster managers evaluate different populations to estimate risk. Um, uh, uh, actually, you know, like what's interesting is, you know, applying this to thinking about the vaccine is that, is that most vulnerable have to make a determination about hazards on a spectrum of their daily threats, right? And, and as we know, the greatest influence is from immediate peers. But facing that spectrum of hazards actually leads to more flexible thinking about risk mitigation um, than I think people attribute it for. Because that's well known in hurricane evacuations and all kinds of ways that people evaluate risk in across business literature and, and uh, disaster management literature and otherwise. So simple education campaigns don't really change people's perception of a risk from a hazard. And nuanced delivery of messages coming from an official is based really on the perception of that official's caring and competence. And as doctors, this is like what we're great at, right? So um, just to take it, you can read this later if you want, but risk perception of novel threats, that is the, that's the sort of the highest level of risk. You know, people really view these novel threats. And now that COVID's not really a novel threat anymore, it's actually the vaccine that's that's more of a novel, novel threat, right? So the origins of it, perceived control, man-made harms being more scary than natural ones, um, dread, 
trust, lack of fear, lack of trust in public officials um, and familiarity um, all drive people's perceptions of risk. And, and I think with the vaccine, that is um, something to think about. And novel threats and inflexible thinking about risk um, is attributed to low educational attainment, but with stable socioeconomic status, scientists actually don't, uh, don't perceive risk very well if it's a novel threat because they wait for evidence to be attributed to how dangerous it is. And then across demographic and racial divides, uh, white males generally have the most inflexible thinking. So now that we're after the emergency, I think it's safe to say we went through an emergency. Once MSF is in New York City, we are there. Um, we really have to think about, uh, we really have to think about the long game here. And, um, and it's important to remember that like increased confidence in a healthcare system really rides a lot on our ability to take care of people through emergencies. And this failure to rescue undermines participation in public health programs, including prevention and primary care. And that's how we operate in Haiti. You know, we really have to think about our ability to save. And then that gives us sort of the credibility to, you know, move on inoculation campaigns and pediatrics and all kinds of health literacy campaigns and stuff like that. They're, they're very inextricably um, tied together. So an interesting way to think about it um, in the context in which we face now. So I think that, I think I got that out in <laughs> just the right amount of time, hopefully. That, that, was Speed presentation. that was amazing, Dr. Gray. Thank you so much. It was truly a fascinating journey that you shared with us and uh, sort of once in a lifetime, and in your case, multiple times in a lifetime. Yeah, you got it. They should come with a disclaimer when they hire me places. So anyway, well, thank you so much. And I thank Dr. DiMarcino for sponsoring today's uh, Global Health Rounds and for Grand Rounds in the Department of Medicine. Please don't forget to look in the chat and uh, get, get your CME and MOC uh, credits. And if you have any questions, I know Dr. Greg will be happy to answer them via email uh, at any point in time. So everyone be safe and have a great day. Thank you so much for today's participation. Thank you.